Good evening, everybody. Hope y'all are doing well. And um, uh, I've enjoyed I've, en- I've enjoyed being with you and being connected and and, and kind of uh, growing alongside you because that's what we do in church life. We're growing together. And on Sundays, I'm uh, an interim pastor down in Macon, and so usually Matt Duvall is calling me when he's driving from Rome, and I'm driving to Macon, and we're just kind of sharing notes here and. We inevitably get to well. What are you preaching on this to, uh, th- this morning? And and we'll we'll we sometimes swap stories. Well, I don't know if he takes my stories, but I take his all the time. So I know he's had a great experience with y'all as well. So good to be back with you. Okay, so uh, learning to tell time. So my first question is to the group. It's not a difficult question. It's a preference question. Do you prefer a digital watch or an analog watch? A watch with hands or a watch that just basically is digital? Just speak out. Wow, it's overwhelming. Analog. Does anybody prefer a digital clock? I'm just curious now. (laughs) What's that? Only at night. Only at night. Well, I understand that too. Yeah, yeah. I, and I wonder, that, 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 it, I'm not too surprised by the answer, but I do wonder if that's generational. I prefer analog. I, I do. And, uh, you know, we were uh, in raising our kids and teaching them to tell time. It was important for us to teach them how to learn analog time and so forth. But uh, my kids are of the generation to where wearing a wristwatch was, um, they just didn't do it. You know, I mean, I, I grew up and probably like you that, Receiving a watch as a gift was a kind of a, a rite of passage, you know, and my first watch was a Timex. Um, and, uh, and so as our kids became teenagers and so forth, telling time was really something you, you used your cell phone with. Uh, so that was, for a long time, I think, a primary way for uh, now young adults to, to use for time. And then, and then come along, uh, came along... Fitbits and sport watches, and so now you're seeing more people wear wrist watches, but those are primarily digital. I, I'm wearing a, a sports watch, but I, I intentionally have an analog face on it. I, I just prefer an analog face there. Um, so, so telling time is kind of interesting uh, because we we take it for granted, but the truth is, having our own personal timepieces is only a few centuries old. And for that matter, it would often not be on your wrist, but maybe a grandfather clock or a mantle clock and, and, and so forth. If I recall, Doc wears uh, an antique wristwatch. I want to say it's from a family member that he uh, often will wear. So timepieces, and we use them as decorations, as jewelry, but functionally uh, they provide a way for us to know the time, to, to tell the time. Time is also an interesting way that we relate. Um, so uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm amused at how uh, people do perceive being on time. For some folks, being on time is 15 or 20 minutes in the vicinity of the time you expected them, right? And I, my, my father kind of was of the attitude that if you're on time, you're late. So I'm 55 years old, and to this very day, I get early. I get a little anxious if I feel like I'm getting really, even driving here, as a matter of fact, I was sitting there thinking, oh, traffic gets a little thick, and I mean, at worst, I was going to be three minutes after five getting here, like that was going to really make a big difference to everything, but, but we all have a different relationship with what we mean by time. I know y'all have heard this, but in the Greek, in the New Testament, you know, there are two words predominantly used for time. Chronos is the time that when we talk about uh, on a clock, you know, clock time and, or calendar time, chronos, uh, from which we get the word chronology and so forth. And then the other word in the New Testament is kairos, and thinking of kairos time as seasonal time. Now, in the Hebrew, we're in the Old Testament tonight, there are equivalents here, but it's, it's, it's not quite the same thing because in general, Hebrew time, or uh, you could say Old Testament time, is always about being seasonal. That's maybe oversimplification. That's the kind of time we're talking about here. I recognize that we continue to value time on the watch, the schedule. Uh, ask any preacher and they'll tell you you really don't want to go over noon in the Sunday morning service. We, we know what time is like. Um, 
But I also think that as we mature, we recognize the importance of understanding seasons as they come and as they go. So I want to open up with a story or continue with a story. It's a, a Taoist story. I am convinced most of you have heard this before, but it's a good way to introduce Ecclesiastes 3. So there's, there's this Taoist story that goes something like this. That there was an old farmer who'd worked his crop for many years, and uh, one day his horse was spooked and ran away. Now, you know, in the ancient times, that's, that's a significant loss. All the neighbors came together, and they said very sympathetically, oh, such bad luck. And the farmer said, maybe. The next morning, the same horse returned, bringing with it three other wild horses in its tow. How wonderful, all of the neighbors said. Must be good luck. The farmer said, maybe. The next day, his son tried to ride one of those wild horses and was thrown and broke his leg. The neighbors came together and said, oh, such bad luck. The farmer said, maybe. The day after, the military came and to the village, and they were drafting all of the young men in the village, but the son with a broken leg was not qualified to be drafted. And all the neighbors congratulated the farmer on his good luck. And the farmer replied, maybe. And I tell you that story to just simply say that we so often look at the events in our lives, the chronos in our lives, the time in our life, as definitive of our experience. And what Ecclesiastes and other writings in Scripture want to remind us, that things have their season. In fact, Ecclesiastes strongly states all things have their season. So let's move. They did me the greatest favor by printing out my slides so I wouldn't have to memorize my own slides. Um, I'll keep this up here because you did such a good job getting it ready for me. So let's, let's um, actually, I, I'm, I'm already jumping ahead of my own slides here. So I've got, you've got handouts on your table. Um, and it's this slide here, because I, I, I know y'all can't <laughs> read the slide from your seat. That's just for you to keep. Uh, it's the theological topics uh, that Ecclesiastes covers. And you can see it's, it's quite a list here, ranging from the absurdity to, of life to, to all the way to work and, um, and, and everything in between. And so if you're kind of wanting to look at a theological reference for Ecclesiastes, that's just something you put in your Bibles or take home, or even, you know, if you want to do a little uh, uh, private Bible study of sorts to kind of look at some of the big themes there. So I'll just have that there for your information. It's not directly germane for tonight except for a couple of issues there. So let's move to the next slide. We're going to begin by reading the, uh, the selection of verses um, 1 through 8. So for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to, to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to love, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Now you'll be relieved to know I'm not going to break this down and let's unpack every verse here because number one, it's poetry. Right? And the worst thing you can do to poetry is to try to tear it to pieces, to try to understand it. You'll miss the music that way. There's a song called Dissecting the Bird, and it, it's a song that kind of uh, presses the point that you can dissect a bird to try to discover the song, but you'll never find the song. You can break something down in all of its parts, but the sum is always greater than its parts. So I'm not going to necessarily go through each of these at all but I, I want to hold it before you to say to look at this as uh, as what it stands for the changing of season so my question to you 
for us to kind of dialogue about tonight is what does this mean to you? Oh, I lost my slide, didn't I? Pardon? I do? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, if we could keep the verse up there, I apologize. I saw you moving the cursor, and I just thought you were browsing on Google or something. I didn't want to. <laughs> I mean, do, 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 you've heard this before, right? This is not unfamiliar. Um, I read it a lot at funerals. Um, you know, every preacher has some of their favorite passages they like for funerals, but for me, it's kind of a way to kind of remind ourselves that we all work through these seasons and um, sometimes I'll read the whole poem and sometimes I'll just simply read to the point where it speaks of uh, uh, um, a, a time to uh, uh, in, in terms of oh wait a minute um, the next the slide before that I'm sorry verses uh, where it begins with verse one there we go uh, yeah, time to be born and a time to die. But what does it mean to y'all? I mean, what is it? Does anything out of this kind of speak to you a little bit? Right. It's intended to kind of, kind of speak to the fullness of that. How have you experienced a season for everything in your life? I'm just curious. I, I started out with a, a Taoist saying or parable, and then we transition into this Hebrew text of Ecclesiastes three. But how have you experienced a season for everything? Okay, so the literal way, yeah, yeah, yeah. What about in the uh, the philosophical or or spiritual realm or emotional realm? So you use it, the, uh, I think, I'll, I'll use a kind of a, a parenting analogy too to kind of piggyback off of that. I remember when our boys, uh, my, my oldest, when he went away to college, you know, he, he, he went to Young Harris. And so we made the, the, the where we were, we were in Augusta, we made the four-hour drive, dropped our oldest son off to school, and, you know, we had, a, we had one of those quiet car rides home. Amy's kind of sniffling in the passenger seat, and I'm trying to keep it together, and we're fine. And then we get home, and it's, it's fine, but it's, it's not the same. And I went upstairs to get something, and I went by his room, and it was empty. And I, I came downstairs, and I tried to say something, and I just blurted out crying, you know, all of that. And then three weeks later, we got over it. I mean, it was really interesting, right? <laughs> this is not bad. That's right. <laughs> And we are loving it. This has been like, you know, 10, 15 years since, right? But, but th not, there's nothing I said untrue. So it, th there's the leaning into the wisdom of what does it mean to live in the seasons. And it's not that every season is pleasant. That's not what's being said here. I mean, there's, there's negatives. You could say there's negatives throughout a time to die. I mean, nobody wants to really embrace that. Unless death itself becomes the blessing in the season you're in. And that's, it's quite poignant when you put it that way. Or, um, well, I mean, we could go all the way through that. Are, are things negatives? Are they positives? I'm not sure that's what the author's intent. Is a time to kill a negative or a positive? Well, I, I guess you have to say it kind of depends, right? Um, uh, a time to break down, time to build up. In fact, when you read the prophets, Jeremiah and Isaiah, uh, there's, there's this language of, um, of, of, of extremes here. So there's always about tearing down and building up in the prophetic tradition. There's judgment and then there's grace. I mean, that's throughout the Old Testament there. So living in the seasons is just that. It's kind of this recognition that these cycles come and go. They're not necessarily about predestination. It's just simply the acknowledgement that, uh, of, of where we live here. Uh, here here's the thing. Um, so that, that even in matters of faith, there's not going to be quick and easy answers to any of this. There's just not. 
there's no way to, I'm going to just play with these verses here, there's no way to ensure ourselves that if you do all of these right things, you can avoid the season of dying or death. And I don't just mean for you personally, but those at whom you love the most. Um, if you live in the seasons, you know, there's no guarantee that uh, uh, everything is about um, um, generative growth and not about harvesting or killing or healing or breaking down, building, weep and laughing, you know. I, I like laughing. I mean, y'all have been around me enough to know that I think, you know, it's important to smile and enjoy life here. But that doesn't mean that everything about life is deserving a laugh. It, in fact, quite often laughter can be the very wrong thing to do. Uh, in the season or mourning and dancing right um, we've all attended funerals where we've walked away feeling better about things because we realized that was truly a celebration and an affirmation of life again it's living in those seasons there uh, the challenge in the faith community is that we is to be faithful uh, Ecclesiastes re reminds us when we live in a world in which it's all about don't tell us the difficult things, the hard things, the things that we don't want to hear, that's kind of offering a, a bad bill of sales here. It's kind of religious propaganda for the masses. It's not at all appropriate. Um, it's fast food religion. Now, I, I like some fast food nothing wrong with it but if you eat it three times a day it's probably not going to be good for you and it's not real uh, we often talk about well how can we reach young people churches everywhere how do we reach young people and I think one of the things that young adults are struggling to find is authenticity uh, and so our mistake and I'm not not implying the second ponce because I'm not your pastor, so I really don't know what you have done, but I've been a pastor a long while, and I know I've been guilty of this, is we try to figure out what do young adults want, and we want to cater things towards a certain demographic. I think what's happening in the 21st century is young adults are wanting things a little bit more authentic. In other words, to just simply be real. Let's talk about what's not pleasant or a struggle or some of the hardships. that, that uh, And I, I, uh, not for all, but I think for many, it becomes a more genuine way of experiencing the faith. You know, we want the prayer of Jabez or the 40 days of purpose or your life now to be the answers to everything we've been searching for. But Ecclesiastes is not about being apocalyptic. You know, the world is ending as we know it, but neither is it humanistic. Don't worry, be happy. Uh, it gives us the language to speak in between the seasons there. What else about verses 1 through 8? Why don't we go to the next slide just to look at the remaining verses of that, verses um, 5 and following. Yeah, what is it about this passage that either percolates up and you're thinking, that's interesting. I mean, this, there's so many goodies here. I, I like the one, you know, here's the guy running his mouth all the time. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. I've noticed through, the, through my life that, that if you can master that, you're a wise person. So many things are much better if you just don't say anything. And likewise, there are occasions where a well-chosen word is what is most needed there. A time to love and a time to hate, that seems kind of anti-Christian, doesn't it? What do, you, what do you make of that? What is it? Okay, so hate the things that destroy humankind, sin. Sin is that rupture of relationship between God and humanity. And so hating that which separates us from the love of God, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's plenty. <laughs> Sound like you got a story there. No, would you like to talk? I'm sorry, my phone is just ringing all. I mean, I'm getting text messages. From somebody. I'm so, so would you like to unpack that a little bit? Let go of it? Okay, yeah. That's a good point there. Close, okay, you always go back to the literal. <laughs> Clothes that don't fit. Let it go. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, 
That's a, that's a good word. That, years ago, um, I, like, I like camping. We're going to go camping in a few weeks. And, I, and, and my, my wife loves to camp. She doesn't love to hike. She likes the idea of hiking. She doesn't like the application of hiking. But she loves to camp. And so when we go, um, I'll disappear in the woods for the day and then, and then make my way back. And so one particular day, and if y'all are go to the Smoky Mountains, you may know some of these places. Uh, I had hiked from um, Newfound Gap, which is like the, the top area between Tennessee and North Carolina. And there's like a 14-mile stretch. It takes you all the way down to Deep Creek. So I'd hike that, 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 that trail that day, got in, and was waiting on Amy to pick me up. And uh, she picked me up. And uh, that night, it dawned on me that I had left my hiking stick at the trailhead and the hiking stick was a dogwood uh, uh, staff or stick that my oldest son had whittled for me back when he was in middle school and I I've hiked hundreds of miles with this stick and I mean I was just I was so broken up about that I, thought, oh, I can't believe I left that and so we talked about maybe driving in the morning but I thought there's no way that hiking stick's going to still be there and and uh, I I kid you not I was on the verge of tears at the thought of, I've lost this precious hiking stick. And I felt a little embarrassed about that. I mean, I'm a grown man. I'd already talked about celebrating that we're empty nesting and all of those good things. And uh, I was telling this to a friend who's a therapist. And I just said, you know, I can't even believe uh, that I, I'm so upset about losing this hiking stick. Now, by the way, I, it was there at the trailhead. So I was able to recover it. Um, and he said, yeah, you know, we call that in psychology a transitional object. It's a transitional object. He says, well, think of it like a security blanket. We have things in our lives that we hang on to because they give us security and comfort. And you never outgrow that. We all have things that we hold on to. And he said, you know, wisdom is when you reach a place in your life when you no longer need that and you let that go, even if it's some, a symbolic letting go. And I've thought a lot about that. It's been about 10 years since this happened. I still have the hiking stick. I still take it with me on every trail hike I take. But I, I wonder when that time will come when you go, you know, I'd, it's okay to let these things go. So I didn't mean to ramble on, but you, you, you brought that up. And, and I, 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 I do think that the secret of life is learning to walk lightly in this world. That I don't need this and I don't need that. And can't we maybe agree loosely that when we learn to let go is when we actually are able to better receive the more simpler things and gifts. I'll give you one more story and then I'll, 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 I'll go on. And I hope y'all will take this in the right way. But it's funny, when, when we were young newlyweds, Amy and I have been married 30, 33, going on 34 years. When we were young newlyweds, and you know, you're, you're as I mean, we poor, poor seminarian students, you know, all of the woe is me stories that go along with that. And I can remember going through Walmart as newlyweds and just saying, oh, I wish I had money for this or that. And, uh, you know, the couch seat change that you're taking to the laundromat to wash clothes, all of those kind of stories. Y'all have them. Uh, we had them. Funny thing happens when you get older and your children grow up and you're gone. Uh, and, and please take this the right way. I'm at an age where our, ex our expenses are minimal, our income is okay, I have more discretionary spending than I've ever had, and I don't really want that much. I, I just, there's just, I go to Walmart now because I have to, <laughs> and not because, you know, I want something, right? I mean, am I the only one in the room? I mean, don't, don't we get to places in life where it's like, yeah, I I just don't need that. You know, it's not that we don't have needs, right? But so it's seasons. It's seasons. Doesn't mean I won't have other seasons where I need or want or what have you there. So kind of chasing some rabbits here, but I Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 through 8, actually really all of chapter 3 essentially is the poetic embodiment of the entire book. When you get right down to it, it is the hinge in which the book folds upon itself or opens upon itself. It, it, it allows us the language to say, this is what life is all about. It is about gathering. It's about scattering. It's about living. It's about dying. It is, it is about loving. It is about hate. It is about war. 
And it is about peace. And the wiser ones among us know the seasons that we're in and live in them faithfully, knowing that, yes, even this season will pass. So when we find ourselves at those mountaintop experiences where life is good, embrace it and live fully. Because that will pass too. And that's not being dire or dour. It's just a recognition that, oh, this is the season that we're in. And the faithful begin to see how is God present in the seasons. That's the key, right? How is God present in these seasons? Let's, let's move to verse 9. So what gain of the workers from their toil? He goes back to this again. <laughs> what gain do the workers have from their toil? It's, it's like a question mark to the previous eight verses. So if you work so hard, what, what does it matter? I have seen the business that God has given everyone to be busy with. He's made everything suitable. Here it is, for its time. Moreover, he's put a sense of past and future in their minds, yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Let's stop there at verse 11 for just a moment. He's put a sense of past and future in their minds, in our minds. What is, what is meant by that? Yes, yes, good. Other thoughts on that? I mean, we do it all the time. We live that verse out. We think about our past. Um, I've, tonight, I've looked at one, two, three different... It's interesting that from two different members, I've looked at sepia tone photographs from the past. I've loved it, right? Not related, but I mean, it's just people showing me pictures and connections, that sort of thing. And so our past, you know, is something that, that, that holds us. It can paralyze us, it can liberate us, it can give us affirmation. But the past is something that we do all live in. But we also have a sense of the future. So, you know, when you're young, you're kind of thinking about your aspirations. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to accomplish? And as we get older, we begin to think about our future more philosophically. You know, what is this life all about? What will, what will be said of me when my time has come? Or even more immediately, I'm anxious about the next year or what, what have you. So when you have a sense of past and future, you know, it can, it can either be paralyzing or liberating here. And probably the most frustrating of all is that we're not God. We feel like it'd be a lot better if we were God and we knew what does this all mean, our past, and where are we all going, our future. But we're not. And Ecclesiastes points this out. Verse 12, I know that there's nothing better for them than to be happy, enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it's God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure all of their toil. I want to stop there, verse 13. It's God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in their toil. The funerals I love the most are the ones I get to celebrate people who live out that verse. I mean that. To just enjoy life. To say, you know, I, I worked a number of years, but my whole life wasn't all about my career. Oh my goodness, I hope the preacher has something to say about me more than just the work I did. You know, think about that. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to do this, but go home and write your obituary. Seriously, go home and write it out or at least think it out. I mean, what, is, what is it that you want someone to say about you? Do you really want them to say, well, he or she worked 41 years at such and such company and they were recognized as employee of the year in 1946? I mean, do you, is that what you really want? I mean, you know, for me, I mean, I, I hope they say, well, he... he he had, a, he had a big laugh, and he learned how to whisper in a sawmill. And, you know, I mean, I want them to just, I want them to say things that are more colorful and texture oriented about life and family and friends and things like that. So, right, to know the seasons. Um, verse 14, I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added. Um, 
uh, nothing nor nothing taken away from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already is, and God seeks out what has gone by. That's what we do every Sunday morning and maybe every day of the week is simply acknowledge the very being and presence of God within our season. So what the what the book of Ecclesiastes does is it gives us a divine yes, an amen, that when we accept the, the task given to us by God, this too is part of God's gift to us. So Ecclesiastes is kind of a life-affirming, people-affirming, work-affirming, pleasure-affirming, and it's rooted in the acknowledgement that all of this is from God. So celebrate that. The simple gift of food, to have someone to talk to around a table on a Wednesday night dinner, you know, or during the week when you're having coffee at McDonald's, celebrate these things. Okay, let's, um, let's keep moving here. Um, the, the next, we're not going to make it to chapter four, I can tell you that. I can tell the time and tell you we're not going to do that. So, um, so what gain, uh, more, uh, uh, I thought I had verse, oh, I did read it, I'm sorry, I did. So, um, thank you, yeah. So, more of us saw under the sun that in place of justice, wickedness was there, and in place of righteousness, wickedness was there as well. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for he has appointed a time for every matter and for every work. Let's go to verse 18. Um, did I include that? I said in my heart with regard to human beings that God is testing them to show that they are but animals. This is quite a statement. For the fate of humans and the fate of animals is the same as one dies, so does the other. They all have the same breath, and humans have no advantage over the animals, for all is vanity. Now he suddenly takes a turn, doesn't he? All right, so what is he saying that's right? <coughs> Excuse me. I mean, it's okay. It's, you're, you're not going to... Do we have the same fate as animals? Pardon? We're all going to die. Now remember, we're in Hebrew scriptures here, so we're, we're, we, we, we don't want to impose Christian theology just yet. So we just want to take it at face face. So we're all going to die. This notion of breath is important because in the Jewish understanding, life begins when one draws breath. And life ends when one ceases to breathe. Because all breath comes from God. Ruah in the creation story. <laughs> excuse me it's the same <coughs> pardon me i'm gonna grab some uh, water it's the same word that is used for spirit it's the same word that's used in creation stories how god breathed into the nostrils of humankind and uh, they uh, took on the image of god so on the one hand we're all in this together and and yet it sounds kind of fatalistic like we're all in this together so we're no better off than our dogs and our cats and our parakeets. But by the way, when we get to heaven and if they don't have dogs, I'm going to be deeply disappointed. <laughs> I just want to hold that out there. And we can talk after this Bible study about do dogs go to heaven or not. Cats, I'm not so sure about. But anyway, <laughs> sorry. All right. Um, so, so um, The question has been asked, and, we, and, I, and I get this question uh, often, what, what was the Jewish understanding of resurrection, or maybe more, more uh, immediately afterlife? Well, it's kind of all over the map. There's really not an organized or systematic theology of the afterlife. More common that we read in the Old Testament is Sheol. Let's, let's jump to the, the next slide here, a little interlude on Sheol. Um, this is uh, from chapter 9, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Now, Sheol is only mentioned here in Ecclesiastes, but it's important to chapter 3, the implication there. So we'll just go to this next slide, which is an image, probably not a great image to close out the study on. But Sheol, in Hebrew understanding, was kind of a nether world. Uh, it's a it's a it's a place where you go and you die, but it wasn't was it for punishment? Maybe, maybe not. Was it 
for the righteous? Maybe, maybe not. There's just not a clear theology of that. I, I once asked a rabbi, his own personal thought, Rabbi in Augusta, I said, well, what's your personal thoughts about uh, uh, the afterlife and he literally said I don't really give that much thought uh, for me the Hebrew scriptures is directing me to live a righteous life while I'm alive and it's kind of his way of saying we'll let God work out all of those details in the afterlife now that may not be very satisfactory to us uh, but understand Jesus lived in that world and so he dealt with debates between remember the Pharisees and the Sadducees the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees did believe in the resurrection of the dead. So Jesus was dealing with those rabbinic debates in the first century there. Now, so what does this have to do with, with any of this other than the fact that Ecclesiastes will be very unsatisfactory reading if we're thinking we do all of these things because we'll get a reward in the afterlife. Ecclesiastes is not concerned with that. Ecclesiastes is concerned that we pay attention to the life we have now, that we do well, we, we live well today. And I want to say to you, I'm obviously a Christian, so I'm not working against afterlife, but I think we would all do better if we heeded those words too, to remind ourselves we can't be so heaven-bound focused that we're no earthly good. We get this life. We're, we don't affirm reincarnation as believers so we only have this one life to live we should live it well and living well doesn't simply mean eat drink and be merry it is knowing what time it is and living faithfully in that time knowing that that too is a gift of God all right I probably threw a whole lot out at the last five minutes what are your thoughts what are your concerns with this You know, we can't, we can't have Ecclesiastes answer questions that they're not even addressing. And one of those is, you know, the Christian issues of resurrection and afterlife. Those are very much central in the New Testament teachings. But they're just not part of Ecclesiastes. They're really not part of the Old Testament in general. Although the Old Testament does have indications of, of this, but it doesn't have a systematic theology of the afterlife. We have to go to the New Testament to get that. But thoughts? Or concerns, or pushbacks, or what have you. All right, the one thing I want to kind of leave us with that we kind of glossed over very quickly was this notion that, all right, if all the, if the same fate that is death awaits us all, um, one of the things I think Ecclesiastes is trying to recover is that if you believe in a retributive re retributive justice. Uh, it's going to be very unsatisfactory. In other words, the wicked are not always punished on earth, and the righteous are not always given the gifts on earth. Sometimes bad things happen to good people, and there's no way to reconcile that. And so uh, th this becomes this crisis of theodicy. You know, why does evil exist if God is good and just? Again, it's learning to live in, in the times here. Anything else? I'm not rushing it. I got plenty of time. I <laughs> get the pun. All right. Well, so Job, that's a good comparison there. So Job is considered the, the most ancient of, uh, of texts of Scripture in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, Jewish theologians look at it as largely a parable that kind of made its way into the canon and, and venerated as such. I think there's lots of overtures with that. So Job doesn't deal with why do... Job doesn't answer the question, why do bad things happen to good people? In fact, you know in reading Job, there's no answer to that. It basically kind of concludes with, God is the one that gives everything, and it happens to us all. You can do all the right things, and bad things can still happen, right? So I think Ecclesiastes is in that vein and if we follow the dating of Ecclesiastes it does come much later than the writing of Job so there's no question that the author of Ecclesiastes would have been very familiar with that and yet in Jewish thought there was struggles with surely if the righteous do all of these things they will ultimately be rewarded here on earth and surely if the wicked do all of these things they will meet their punishment on earth but if you live long enough 
you know that's not true. It's never been true. We want it to be true, but it's just not true. So we have to, in many ways, trust in the life we have and in the God who gives us this life and how that will be reconciled in the hereafter, which that too is in God's hands, right? Yeah. Comments? All right, so we got two more of these, and uh, next week we're going to jump, I think, into chapter 7 and move our way through a couple of chapters there. And, you, and, and then the last week, um, do you, I don't know, if, oh, I don't want to ask you to turn to those. So the last week's title escapes me, but it's a, it's a parable or an allegory of old age, and I'll, it's from chapter 12. So spend a little time looking at that ahead. I'm, I'm, uh, I always look forward to kind of looking at that uh, a bit and, uh, and unpacking that some. We, we didn't even get into chapter 4, and that's okay. Uh, but I, I want to just simply repeat that chapter 3 really becomes that poetic expression of the entire book here. So, oh, thank you. Yeah, gray hair, few teeth, big smile. That's in a couple of weeks. So I know some of you already said I'm not going to be there. <laughs> not coming that Sunday. All right, well, listen, thank you again. Let's, uh, let's close with prayer. <laughs> Lord, we don't always know what time it is. We, we don't always understand the season that we're living in or the season that we find ourselves in this church or this world. Our prayer, God, is that whatever time it is, that you would find us faithful in this season but thanks be to you O Christ that even when we struggle to be faithful we are nevertheless leaning into your grace that is always in season in Jesus name we pray amen and amen all right thank y'all for another great evening